Hi, Jen. How are you doing? Hi, Juan. Happy Easter. <laughs> Sorry, we can start oh, over. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> Um, uh, but you know, that's the whole thing. It's so natural and easy. Yeah. Hey, Jen, how you doing? Good one. How are you doing? I think I'm doing pretty good. I think I'm going to survive. Uh, okay. you know, I promised people that, uh, you know, hoped anyway, that I'd be able to do a broadcast before we got to Easter Sunday and that whole period. And I wanted to kind of uh, review something with folks. You know, we talked about Esther and other things. And um, the concern I had is that, you know, uh, a lot of practices have been sifted in to the church and to our nation and to the politics even that are really an affront to God. And if we're looking to have a blessing from God to um, be thankful for the blessing of protection and survival and, and getting through this COVID thing, um, you know, I, I remember I was with a uh, uh, person years ago who had done a video presentation in the height of the uh, Monica Lewinsky stuff and <clears throat> the impeachment of Bill Clinton. And they had uh, concluded the video they put together, God Bless America. And my instant thought when he said that, and I heard the video and I was like, yeah. <laughs> which America? <laughs> what America Ooh. are you talking about? Um, because at that time, while most people really weren't uh, aware of it or seeing it or understanding it, the uh, things that I was um watching, aware of, concerned about, uh, were really, really bothering me. Uh, the knowledge that Hillary was a practicing witch, um, you know, Bill and Hillary went to Haiti for their honeymoon and, and Bill wrote in his book at a later time, how, uh, amazed and enthralled he was with the, uh, way the witch doctor was able to control the voodoo victim and the magic, uh, that he was able to exercise over people. And, you know, uh, Hillary had all of the um, fertility goddess idols all over the Christmas tree and condoms and, you know, her name being Evergreen. And uh, one of the names of Satan is the green man. So every time I see, you know, uh, green everything, it, it sends chills through me because I'm thinking that, you know, this is code for some other nefarious stuff. Um, so I, I have to take a deep breath on a lot of that stuff because I think people naively think, you know, well, we're a, a godly nation and so God should just take care of us. I remember I was with a, a very incredible inventor uh, years ago when I was fairly young um, in my early 20s. And we were talking about a device that he had constructed that... Uh, uh, he had dreamed up that was really revolutionary at the time related to security products. And um, he had told me, you know, he, his history was as an air traffic controller in the military. And so he was at a particular airfield where he'd been for about a year and a half and it happened to have fog an awful lot of the time. So he had a routine, even though it would be sunny out uh, where there was a, uh, a higher hill and he would have the aircraft go by that location and he could radio triangulate where they were at and then he would do a count if they got their airspeed at a specific airspeed and their rate of descent to a specific rate of descent he could put them on the uh, runway even in the fog and he had kind of perfected this it was just his little thing he kept having aircraft go through this routine you know perfectly good sunny days etc and then out of the blue one day, uh, you know, the not so blue foggy uh, uh, morning, they had a civilian aircraft that was in dire emergency and um, they had to land immediately. 
and no airfield could take them because they couldn't they you know this is years and years ago this was in the earlier mid 60s and uh there was no way to get this aircraft uh, down anywhere they everybody was you know wringing their hands and so he was listening to this emergency and he said uh, he came into the conversation with other air traffic controls the civilian ones and said i can take this and i have it uh, down and he talked the pilot through this process that he had perfected and brought him in and they landed on the runway safety and over a hundred lives, a hundred souls oh, wow. survived that day. And it was a very, you know, made your hair stand up on end type of thing. And, and he took a lot of time with all the intricate details explaining it to me. And he said, you know, um, it was Catholic. He said, uh, you know, so I know I'm going to heaven because, uh, you know, God, uh, saw that I saved all those lives. And so after this beautiful story, this incredible rendition, the next thing that comes to mind is, oh my gosh, you know, uh, that's not how it happens. And I was thinking of Solomon. You know, Solomon is the uh, wisest man that ever lived, according to legend. Uh, because when he had a dream and was asked, you know, anything that he would ask of God, a visitation really from uh, the Lord, he asked for wisdom. And so that was granted to him. And so uh, he had all this incredible wisdom. He became king of uh, Israel, Israel uh, after David, his father. And he built all this incredible uh, temple and uh buildings and everything else but as he got older in life uh if you remember we talked about our hazardous and xerxes and they had all these you know the, the king same name just or same person different names this king of persia uh he had a harem of wives and concubines and esther became his queen um and so we think of solomon well it says that solomon had i believe it was 700 wives and 300 concubines so he had all these women you know for you know sex and children and everything else and the contention is that uh, what the bible says is at the end of his life he turned away from god even though he'd had two um appearances of the Lord before him. He'd seen the Lord God twice uh, appeared to him. And yet after that, he still turned and worshiped the gods of his wives. He, he, his faith went to something else. And um, so he was really, uh, you know, not blessed, not a man of God at the end of his life. And he allowed what were called the Ashtoreths to be assembled around Jerusalem and on the hills. Uh, it was very detestable to God. And of course it led to all the downfall of his Israel. Um, a later king, Asa, uh, God turned his heart. He was raised uh, um, around all of this stuff and Asa, God, you know, spoke to him and he re responded to the call. And um, he had become king. His mother was uh, uh, queen at the time. And because she was doing as Solomon and Solomon's wives had done, worshiping these Ashtoreth and these pagan gods, um, uh, Asa, after having this this revelation from God of what was going on, he had his own mother dethroned, removed from her queenship. And then he had the groves where these idols, these pagan idols to their Ashtoreth God were assembled. He had all of these Ashtoreth brought down by the brook Kidron and burned. And then whatever didn't burn of all of the wood all the way to nothing, 
he had it broken up into tiny pieces. And then he had all the pieces of these idols taken out and spread over the graves of the children. Now that's a really important little thing because normally when people are buried, families are buried, they're buried together. Mom, dad, the children, we see that. It's been a practice forever. But what do we have here? It was a witness to the children sacrificed wow. to the Ashtoreth God that Asa had destroyed those gods and those ashes being spread there was a witness to the evil, to the bloodletting that they had been part of and to uh, uh, make recompense, to make notice of what had happened. And those children's graves were all the way to Bethel, all across Israel, this blood that was on the hands of the people. Now, what was this Ashtoreth God? Well, it had gone back to uh, even before Egypt. Um, uh, we have a history. When we went to uh, Iraq and we looked at all of these old temples while we were doing all of our military work in Iraq and uh, even next door in Syria and stuff like that, uh, some of the things that we came across were these various cities, ancient cities from biblical times. One of the cities had a um, gate that was dedicated to Baal. It was part of a much bigger temple that had been torn down at one point in time, and only the gate itself was left at the base of Mount Hermon. Um, this Baal gate uh, was later des destroyed by ISIS, uh, supposedly, and but before it was destroyed, it had been intricately uh, photographed 3D. And um, in reality, in this ritual, the way these cults think, they had, um, before it was destroyed, make it made a perfect rendition so that it could then be distributed other places in the world. There wouldn't be two. It would continue. The power was going into the next one. And so this duplicate replication made in foam um, which was still fairly heavy, uh, has been moved around the world as though it's an ancient artifact, art piece for everybody's consideration. Um, interestingly enough, uh, even uh, this thing had been planned to come to New York uh, during the um, uh, election period in 2016. Um, and then, you know, people like Hillary and others were going to have their celebrations around it. Uh, this is really, uh, was intended to be a ritual um, thing used for the purposes of, uh, of, you know, getting some kind of ritual energy for those people that were involved in this. Uh, it ended up going to London first and then came over later uh, to the US and, uh, these pagans were all excited to be worshiping at it. One of the interesting things about Mount Hermon is the highest location UN heritage site on the planet uh, is at Mount Hermon. And so I don't remember how high it is. It's 6,000 feet or something, and people can go look at it on Wikipedia. But what do you have? That's the location where the 200 fell to earth who were these um, essentially aliens that um, then commingled their seed with the earthlings and uh, became um, these men of renown. Are these and the, the people, fallen, the 200, are they the fallen angels? Uh, yeah, a lot of people look at it that way. And there's, there's a few different stories around these things. You know, one thing is that we get stories that have all sorts of idolatry, imagery, artifacts, um, writings around them. And they're usually pretty close to the same, but there's a little variation here and there, et cetera. And so, you know, we kind of take all of them um, in, in a little bit of uh, measure. Because, for example, even go back to the book of Adam and Eve, 
uh, that I mentioned before, Lost Books of Eden. Uh, one of the things that's said there pretty consistently is that Satan, Lucifer, told stories to Adam and Eve that weren't true. Uh, for example, one time he appeared to them as an old man and that uh, they were so distraught over having been kicked out of the garden. He told them there was a garden to the north that was as good or better than Eden where they had, had left. And so they followed him because he told them that he was going to take him to this garden. They kept walking and walking and walking until they were almost out of energy. And the story is that uh, uh, Lucifer intended to kill them once they were so tired, but they didn't see past the illusion. They couldn't, they didn't realize it was there. He sh showed as this old man, but that's not who he was. This, the whole story was a lie. Satan, the father of lies. So, um, you know, other times he appeared to them as an angel of light, you know, saying psalms and hymns and things that they heard in the garden that the angels sang to God himself. And yet they weren't, uh, the devil and the ones with him were mimicking things and it fooled Adam and Eve into thinking that this was a good thing. And so several times they were led astray. Uh, on occasion, God um, literally held the serpent in place and decloaked it and showed them the um, vicious hate, the fire in its eyes and hatred toward them. So they understood just exactly what it was they were dealing with, uh, this lying creature that sought only their destruction by whatever means necessary. Um, even though they were under protection, if they got past some certain point, they would get out from under, under the protection of God. And so uh, this deceiving, whatever the stories are, you kind of have to take them with a little grain of salt, and realize there's probably some truth, but it's like uh, telling the difference between a good grape and a bad grape. Um, they both look the same until you bite in a little bit. You realize, oh my gosh, that's sour. You know, it's not, not a good grape. And so, you know, it's easy to be deceived. And sometimes, you know, you will know them by their fruits. Um, a lot of times a tree or a plant looks good. And, uh, but the fruit that it gives at the end of the day isn't good or, or edible. So um, we just have to be aware that there was those lies out there. So this, this gate of ball that was there at the base of Mount Hermon, the people would bring children and offer them to Baal, to Moloch, uh, in order to get a good uh, harvest in the fall, in order to get, you know, protection, blessings, whatever. And uh, this was an affront to God to sacrifice your children. God, God said in, in uh, Deuteronomy, these people do what I didn't ask them to do. I never even never even came into my mind that people would um, offer their children to me as though that was somehow something I asked for. Uh, God said, after uh, these enemies have been destroyed before you, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods as the people came into the promised land and, and destroyed those giants, those monsters. Um, don't ask amongst yourselves, how do these nations serve their gods? We will do the same. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. See that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. That's Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 32. You know, when you think about that, and then, you know, we come forward and we think about this whole Easter thing, where's the name Easter come from? It comes from this Saxon Sumerian uh, god or term 
Eoster, Ostara. Um, that was a Scandinavian goddess. Um, but if you trace the name back, see again, they go by the same symbology. They just changed their name according to the culture. Um, uh, that god was uh, the Phoenician goddess Astarte. Uh, uh, it was the Egyptian Isis. And that was a copy of Semiramis. Um, so, you know, this goes back to, to ancient, ancient times with these people that were worshiping these gods that were these fakes that Satan, the devil, Lucifer had put in there. The devil has a thousand faces. So let's just use Isis. Isis, what was the story of Isis, Jennifer? We've talked about it before, but it, it bears repeating. Isis was this uh, wife of Zeus uh, who had a son, Osiris, and another son, Set. And um, Osiris was very evil, did all sorts of evil, evil things. So the story, the legend, is that his brother Set killed him and chopped him into 14 pieces and scattered the 14 pieces across uh, the earth. And this occurred on the 17th of this first month of the year type of thing. And so um, the number of Osiris is 17, not 14. Some people have asked that. Why is it 17? Because that was his death date. But then Isis, his mother, found that he had been killed and she ran out across the world, gathered up all the pieces that she could find, but she could only find 13 of his body parts. And she assembled them. And it was later learned that the 14th piece, according to some of the legends, uh, was eaten by a fish. And the 14th piece was his penis. So Isis, not wanting her son to die, uh, because he also was a god. She took a stone and fashioned a penis of stone, a dildo, and uh, put it on his dead corpse. And then the mother had sex with the son. And uh, she became pregnant, according to the legend. And the child that she had his name was Horus. So think about just the madness of that story all by itself. Uh, the mother has sex with the son with his corpse. And even at that, uh, she gets pregnant by a piece of stone, as dead as can be in its own way, an idol. Uh, and then supposedly has a son and Horus. And Horus is what? He's the sun god. So we see the sun god rising, uh, and, and that's part of this mythology that these people are into. So um, Isis is, in fact, this same goddess we keep coming back to over and over and over again. She's um, Ishtar uh, in Babylon. Uh, this ancient city that was dedicated to the gods. Each of the gods, the 42 gods of the ancient um, pagan religion had their own gate. So the Ishtar gate was one of the gates uh, in the city of Babylon. Uh, Ishtar is another name for Isis. The devil has a thousand names. And by the way, the devil presents as both male and female. That's why we see this Baphomet creature that is all over the place in these rituals. Why? Because it's intended to show the duality of the male-female person in one person. And um, in the Baphomet, if you look at the illustrations and you go to the books by uh, Crowley and other uh, Satanists, Luciferians, they make a big deal about the phallic symbol um, 
in that statue uh, in the groin and that it is used to make a spiritual child. And so, uh, for example, uh, Crowley uh, wrote a whole book about the moon child. Uh, this child born through magic ritual um, to be the moon child, who was Ishtar. Ishtar in Babylon was the priestess to the moon. All down through the time, uh, uh, Isis, Ishtar, another name was Diana, uh, uh, which was this uh, moon goddess, Venus. Uh, over and over again, uh, we see that same imagery over and over again. What, what do we have here in America that's uh, a statue of Isis? It's a statue of Liberty in New York. That was given by the Masons. Um, and it, was, it has Masonic meaning, but to most people, they don't recognize that there's this tie to Masonry and that it's actually a statue to Isis and the freedom uh, Isis was a fertility god. So um, when you're when you're looking at this and it's and how does Easter as we celebrate it here uh, this Sunday, how do we come up with the Easter Sunday? We come up with it based on lunar cycles. Um, it's a lunar festival in the original pagan holidays, the way it was celebrated. And it was blended, mixed, commingled into the church because there were all these pagans in Europe that the church wanted to bring into the church. And so to help them to understand, they commingled these ideas in with the church celebration um, and the way that they worshiped. For example, um, one of the things, you know, people wonder what's the significance of the rabbit in um, Easter? Well, for example, with China, they consider the moon, when they look at the, look at the moon, they don't see the man in the moon, in the face on the moon. They see the rabbit, the hare. It's a bunny. And that's this um, God in the moon. So uh, the idea of the moon somehow being tied to uh, rabbits and hares and all that sort of thing, why would you have the rabbit bringing the eggs? The eggs are symbolic of fertility. And so Eoster, Astara, uh, Isis, Semiramis, Venus, um, Astarte, all the same God, all the same pagan God, just different names in different eras, um, Isis. Uh, they are the fertility God. And they come out at spring for the Dicia, uh, the Roman holiday, um, when the ground is prepared and everything starts to grow and you do your spring planting and you do your sacrifices in order to get a good fall harvest. And those sacrifices include human sacrifices, child sacrifices to these gods, uh, these idols. And um, Isis is one of them, or is a variation of them. So then we go, well, what's, what's the deal with this, this phallic symbol, this phallos, this penis? Well, again, that's a tribute to Osiris. So where do we find um, these phallos, these Osiris symbols? Well, the most famous one here in America is the Washington Monument. That's a, a great big, huge monument um, to Osiris. The whole city of Washington is a religious cult city, every bit as religious as uh, the Vatican or the city of London for that matter, uh, the city within the city. These are huge religious sites. You don't realize that it. it's not presented to you that way, but they are everything in Washington, DC you know, the buildings, the layout, the streets, the names, the numbers, uh, the alignments, all go back to um, this religious um, group that has been in the background in our country all along, sifting in their ideas, sifting in their 
images, their idols across the land. Um, these huge Ferris wheels in various parts of the world are considered Osiris Eye. You've seen the eye in the pyramid. That's a monument to Osiris. That huge uh, Ferris wheel that you see in these various cities. Um, uh, other things that are variations hiding in plain sight, but have um, the similar meaning as a phallos, as a um, um, phallic symbol, things like the Space Needle in Seattle. And by the way, the company that built the Space Needle, you want to guess what the name of that company was? I don't know. The Pentagram Corporation. Tell me there's not religious significance to all these things. Why do they have to have these images? And they have to have these celebrations done in plain sight, even the rituals of the Super Bowl and the Olympics at these halftime rituals where they have all these weird celebrations and uh, magical acts uh, done. The reason they do that is because when everybody shows up for this huge sporting event, then they can, um, with everybody's eyes on them, they can present their magic act and we all become participants in the magic of uh, you know, one of the things that I mentioned to you here just recently, go to the 2012 Olympics and look at how um, uh, the queen was escorted by James Bond to the beginning of the Olympics. They did a very intricate, uh, well done video, couple minute video of the queen being escorted to the beginning of the Olympics. And then what does she do? She jumps out of her helicopter and falls to earth because she's royalty, she's bloodline royalty, because they were mimicking how did her ancestors get here? They fell to earth. The 200 at Mount Hermes fell to earth. And this is, they believe, a sign that they also are of the same bloodline. What did George Bush do after he uh, or was out of office from the presidency? He skydived three times. And he was doing a ritual, falling to earth to show that he was one of the original bloodlines, uh, these bloodlines that fell to earth. What was the deal with Adam and Eve? You know, people wonder about, you know, is there, you know, aliens out there somewhere? Are they ever going to get here to earth? Well, these bloodlines believe that they're the descendants of the aliens, the alien, that they're, they're alien hybrids. Why? Because Eve was beguiled by the serpent and Eve begot Cain because that was the offspring of this uh, mating between Eve and Lucifer, Satan, the devil, Semiramis. Um, that was the sin in the garden. Uh, and by the way, um, some of the interpretations say that Adam was also uh, sexually involved in that same thing himself. Not just that he went and had sex with Eve and then begot Abel, but he also uh, was violated by Satan, Lucifer, the devil. So there's a lot of legend in there that people have to take a deep breath on and think about. So this Ashtara, these pole gods that it talks about in Kings, uh, one of the scriptures that I think, you know, is worth looking at uh, is in Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel uh, uh, 8, 14 through 18, it says that God brought Ezekiel, uh, the Lord, this messenger, brought Ezekiel to the north gate of the temple. And he had shown him a lot of stuff, but this was like horrible. It says, then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord. And I saw a woman, a woman, I saw women, I should say, sitting there, mourning the God to moves. He said to me, this angelic messenger said to me, do you see this son of man? What's these women, 
you know, mourning the god Tammuz. Well, the god Tammuz was the husband of Isis in ancient legend. And uh, this god Tammuz. I thought it was uh, Zeus. Well, no, that's the father oh. of, uh, of uh, husband of Osiris or of Isis. Um, but her uh, Isis's uh, uh, new husband was Tammuz. Okay. Uh, Ishtar, whatever. Uh, I, I, you know, it's again, you get all these festivals in there and it can really screw you up. <laughs> 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 and so uh, Tammuz, when, when she had had to go down for whatever reason, she was trying to take over hell or something and ended up getting down there and, and being enslaved. And so she wanted to get loose and get back to the surface. And so she makes a deal and she comes up and hell can't have a vacancy is the way it's told. And so she has to send somebody back to hell, give them over to these demon uh, guards that are with her. So she first finds her uh, maidservant and the maidservant's daughter, and they were in sackcloth and mourning because she had died. So she felt bad for them and, and appreciated that they missed her. Then he goes, she goes to her house and she finds that uh, uh, Tammuz is whining and dining and not really showing too much concern that she's not around. And she's so incensed, she's so mad that she turns him over to these demonic messengers and they escort him to her place in hell to replace her. So these women at the north gate of the temple that the angelic messenger is showing to Ezekiel. And you remember we talked about Ezekiel back in the Peaches uh, presentation a video we did a long time back. Ezekiel, uh, you know, he's pretty upset. You know, see these women are, you know, essentially um, praying for, crying for a pagan god. But then the angelic messenger says, um, you will see things that are even more detestable than this. And so he took uh, Ezekiel to the inner court of the house of the Lord, the Holy of Holies, where the um, Ark of the Covenant is, the seat of God, uh, where the high priest meets God. And he says, do you see this, son of man? <clears throat> and at the entrance to the temple, between the portico and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs, their asses, toward the temple of the Lord and their faces to the east and they were bowing down to the sun rising in the east. They were turning their backside to God, their asses to God, and they were worshiping the rising sun. Who was who? Horus, the child of Isis and Osiris the child of this dead, evil entity that the mother recreated from stone out of death, sex with a corpse. How, how much more, you know, iconic of hell and its own, you know, death can you get than that? And then to worship the rising sun to be there, to turn their faces to Horus. There's a real theme here. This isn't just disjointed things. They were involved in worshiping the very gods and the very way that the people they had pushed out of the land after they left Egypt had been worshiping. They'd become the same as the people that they had displaced, that God had brought them to displace, to stop indistinguishable, doing the same rituals, the same way, same gods, different names, same gods. He said to me, have you seen this son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the most detestable things they're doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continuously arouse my anger? Look at them putting their thumb to their nose and thumbing their nose at me. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. 
I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. Because they act like they're doing great big religious things. They're going through all the form of religion. Uh, you know, everybody around them, you know, they're also, you know, spiritual and godly and everything. And they're there at the North Gate, all the women praying for Tammuz. You know, a very spiritual thing. All of the men in there bowing and turning their asses to the altar of God. And uh, their heads and their faces to the rising sun, the creation, not the creator. Um, uh, this was, you know, what happened before God sent the people into uh, slavery again and exile out of the land and sent them off into the world, um, no longer able to live in the land because the land spit them out for all of their evilness, for everything that they were doing. Um, how did this get going? Again, it was Solomon. If you go, if you want to read about Solomon, go to uh, 1 Kings 11, 1 through 9. And by the way, that's where the Bible notes the first 9-11, 9-11. Um, it's, you know, one of those things where we're like, oh my gosh, really? Yeah. It's a, you know, so... When Sorry, we think I didn't about, that. How, how does it quote 9-11, 9-11? Well, uh, Kings 11, 1 through 9, if you want to look at it backwards, it's 9-11-11, if you include oh. the first in the Kings and then the, the first verse. Um, it's just an interesting way of looking at it, the way it's numbered okay. out there. But, you know, um, uh, the theme here is infiltration not invasion see these idolatrous uh, pagans and their practices slowly sifted back in with the people it says that solomon took on wives from all over the world and uh because he was you know a sex maniac even though he was wise he apparently wasn't wise enough to um follow god's uh directives and these women that he brought in had all of their uh, worship ways of doing things that um, were to the Ashtoreths, to uh, these pole gods, to these penises. And uh, that was the way that they worshiped because they were worshiping Osiris. Uh, they were worshiping literally resurrection from death because he was killed and resurrected on the 17th day of the month. That's why Osiris's number is 17. It's this power number for these people. By the way, we talked about James Bond a couple times. Um, James Bond is um, code for John D, who was Queen Victoria's uh, secret agent, keeping track of all the other royal houses and what was going on and any threats that might come to her or the kingdom on Her Majesty's Secret Service. James Bond, when he plays roulette, you might remember when we did the uh, biblical on Esther, that uh, uh, some accounts say that the number of uh, points on the roulette wheel uh, is based on how many women were present in the beauty contest that Esther won. And so uh, what numbers does James Bond always bet when he plays roulette? He always bets black 17 because that's the Osiris number. It's a ritual. Oh, I didn't know James Bond. Yes. So we're saturated in the rituals everywhere. In fact, let me just add one thing. You know, these numbers, people blow it off. Yeah, 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 whatever. Okay. So uh, California Academy of Arts, this talent agency that Bill Maher belongs to, uh, the wizard of Hollywood, uh, go into the Q memes uh, or Q uh, notable persons um, on qmap.pub and then just scroll down a little bit and find the um, uh, data section related to Bill Maher. Uh, and what does it show him in? His wizardry costume. He's a member of uh, uh, SCTM uh, Sanctum. 
of the sex cult, uh, the son of uh, Hugh Hefner with the rabbit fertility cult uh, related to um, Playboy. Uh, and by the way, so CAA, we talked about this number many times, even with the Tom Hanks with sometimes at three in the morning, sometimes at 11 at night with his code speech at the Golden Globes this year, oh. uh, which was code for 311. Mm -hmm. C is three. A is one. A is one. 311. Yep. Okay. Um, we talked about, you know, they like to reverse their numbers, 11-3, 311. Um, uh, you come over to this um, Yale cult, Skull and Bones, and they like their 322-223 reversals. So, for example, in the British Broadcasting Network, BBC, reverse 322, 223. They put their codes everywhere. They love their symbology. They love their hidden numeral language right there in plain sight, but you don't realize it. You don't see in the mirror. You don't know the language. You're just a slave, a sheep. Uh, you don't get to learn the language. You're just there as cannon fodder. You're just there for a sex toy, a breeder. And that's the way they look at you. That's the way they think of you. So all around us, uh, here in the political world in the United States, we are um, really seeing a, a religious and sex cult dominating us and have been for a very long time with all of their idolatry, all of their imagery right there into the capital of the country, right there in the most important uh, city in the country, in New York. Things that happen in New York affect the whole world. It's a very symbolic uh, city. That's why, for example, when the t Twin Towers came down in that religious rite, the 9-11 rite, all of the gods of the ancient Roman and Greek period are right there present viewing this, including things like the Statue of Liberty. Look at all the buildings, the bull down in Wall Street, which, you know, just magically appeared one day and then the artist took credit for it, but they left it there uh, because they needed that imagery there present as a witness um, to their, their ritual, their magic. Uh, you know, Hollywood, uh, somebody was commenting the other day, it's easier to get into the Pentagon than it is to get into the headquarters for CAA, uh, uh, the talent agency out there in LA. Why? Because what they're doing there is so ritually um, important because they affect the thoughts, the way of thinking uh, of the whole world. So from a um, MK Ultra type of a position, uh, they're intricately involved in their magic across the world. That's why uh, Hollywood, the most uh, powerful magic wands are made with wood from the holly tree. And so Hollywood is this magic wand, the most powerful one of all, to um, enthrall, to mesmerize, to do magic on the minds of people throughout the whole world. Uh, and then you, your children learn how to do magic and what it takes to do a magic spell and what's involved and, and all the various powers with all the books like Harry Potter uh, and various other things. And of course, uh, we take them to our festivals, uh, just like uh, Easter, um, which is really a fertility festival based on the worship time of the lunar priestess, Ishtar. Isis, Osiris, I mean, Isis, uh, 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 Aoster, um, we're timing ourselves that, you know, go back to Christmas. Uh, I mentioned, you know, that uh, the green man, Satan is, is uh, uh, referred to sometimes as the green man. Um, what was Hillary? She's evergreen. That was her code name uh, from the Secret Service. What do you have your children do at Christmas time? They go under the tree to receive presents 
under the green tree. And by the way, there's all sorts of scripture about not going and doing ornamenting a tree because that was part of the same types of stuff with this uh, fertility God stuff uh, that has been sifted into our way of doing things, of practicing uh, here in the church. Even a lot of people here will be lamenting the fact that because of, of this shutdown in the country, they won't get to go to their Easter sunrise service. Why would you go to an Easter sunrise service? Well, the risen Christ early in the morning, everything else. Hey, let me tune you up a little bit. The date is based on an Ishtar, Isis, Aoster, pagan ritual. And just like those 25 men in the inner court of the temple, they're turning their ass to God and worshiping the rising sun, Horus. And you think that you're doing something very religious and that you're somehow protected because you're very solemn and religious and you care, but you're not doing it the way God said. Don't add or change anything. Infiltration, not invasion. We've been infiltrated for a very long time. Our people, our nation, our religious services, our politics, our entertainment, everything. These people are everywhere. And what are they doing? They are worshiping a God that requires them to do blood sacrifice, to offer children to him, Baal. I hear what you're saying, and I think a lot of our audience gets it. But I just can imagine when they start telling their, let's say their Christian friends, what would you say or how would you help us explain to the Christian that says, okay, maybe that's the tradition of Easter. Maybe that's historically correct. But I am celebrating Easter for the risen Christ. I mean, that, you know, the average Christian is going to be appalled to think, I mean, they're going to say, I, I'm not promoting blood sacrifice. This is nuts. But how do we, or what would you say to that person that says, hey, you know, or they might call it redemption theology. You know, like we're taking back the numbers. Well, this was a pagan holiday and now we are redeeming the holiday. Um, now, I don't agree with that, but how would you, what would you, how would you answer someone that says that? I'm celebrating Easter I am personally for the risen Christ. Well, I think one thing that we have to remember, even uh, with these lies that the devil Lucifer sifts into our world. Um, I had a conversation uh, earlier today. Uh, it's very similar to ones I've had many times before. Um, this person uh, believes that they're doing good because they do white magic. And so they're trying to help the world doing white magic. And so uh, uh, they're explaining how good of a person they are trying to help in this current situation by doing this white magic and rituals. And then I get a picture of the various books that they're going to in order to learn how to do magic spells with white magic. Uh, they're getting their books out of the Atlantis bookstore in London. And all their books are by Crowley, uh, uh, a Satanist, a Luciferian. Um, it's a lie. It's a demonic lie. And it's sucking in a lot of Christians. And they need to, you know, seek, you know, God's face and turn from this wickedness because, because they're actually in the thrall of demons um, uh, doing demonic activity. They are not doing anything that's uh, Christian that is uh, biblical. Um, you know, let me, let me just tell you a quick story. Uh, years and years ago, and I can't remember, uh, you know, I, I, it seems to me that I had seen the article and, and it would actually was real, but it doesn't matter. It still is a good illustration. Um, and I think, you know, it's kind of falls into the urban legend type thing uh, also. But at the time that I had first heard it, I think it was presented as being truth. There was a lady and her neighbor that lived down on the border with Tijuana in San Diego. And so they would go over the border to go shopping because they get good buys and stuff. And uh, after they're leaving with some clothes and, I, you know, household items that they had, 
uh, they're coming out and the woman sees a chihuahua at the side of the parking lot. And so she goes over, she can tell that it's not feeling well, it's sick, something's wrong with it, there's nobody caring for it, and it's hot out, and it, you know, obviously is in distress. So she decides she's always wanted a chihuahua. She's a very nice lady. She's very sweet. She loves animals. So she gets a towel out, wraps it up, and then you can't bring live animals across the border. So she has to kind of hide it in the bags of stuff they're bringing back. And she gets across the border easy enough, comes back home, and uh, she gets, you know, box out and cares for it and gets a little water dropper and is, you know, uh, feeding it in water and has her kids over taking care of it. And the neighbor kids come over to see the new puppy and they're helping to take care of it. And she's going to nurse it back to health. Her husband comes home from work. She's got it at the foot of the bed. He's like, Oh my gosh, please. Why do you have this in the bedroom? No, no, I got to keep track of it just to keep, make sure it's okay. And you know, he just wants peace. Okay, fine. That's fine. Whatever. So a couple of days go by. It's still not getting any better. It's still looking pretty, pretty bad. So she decides to take it to the uh, uh, veterinarian and she gets there and signs in, fills out all the paperwork and the veterinarian grabs it off the door, reads the thing, comes in and takes a look at what she's written is looking at it on the examination table there. And he says, uh, how long have you had this animal? And she says, oh, you know, we got it uh, quite a while back and she doesn't want to say how she actually got it. So she doesn't want to get anybody, you know, in trouble on herself too. Uh, no, we've had it a while. He's, he's like, lady, how long have you had this animal? And she's kind of startled and she's, you know, well, um, um, listen, woman, this is not a chihuahua. This is a river rat. Oh. <gasps> And it has rabies. Oh, my gosh. Everyone that has been exposed to this <gasps> needs to be immediately tested. And this is back in the old days, the deep, dark days, where the treatment for rabies was seven long needles in the stomach over several days repeatedly to keep them alive and to overcome the effect of rabies on them. So her husband her daughters, the neighbor boys, the neighbor lady, everybody has to be treated for rabies on the chance they may in fact have gotten it. And the problem with this woman is, the problem with the situation, the moral of the story here is just because you're sincere doesn't mean that you can't be sincerely wrong. There's lots of sincere people that are sincerely wrong. Idiots can get you killed. That's one of the things that I've taught guys over the years, over and over. Idiots can get you killed. Check and double check. Cross check all of your equipment. What your situation is. Make sure everybody's on the same page. Somebody that's not awake, not paying attention, can get other people killed because of their not knowing. Had it been in an earlier time before there was a cure for rabies, all of those people could very well have died a very gruesome death. Idiots will get you killed. In this current time period, a sincere person can still be sincerely wrong. Wake up. So this white magic, like you're doing something good for God and you really care about everything. Well, and I'm at the temple of God and I'm crying for Tammuz. And I'm here in the temple of God, uh, bowing to the rising sun that brings life to the earth and spring and getting ready for planting and to have a good harvest. And oh, by the way, we're going to go take some of our newborns and we're going to sacrifice them to Baal and Moloch later today. Oh my gosh. So these things are going on in America. They're going around around the world. What are some of the connotations of some of the things going on behind the scenes, all these people hand wringing, how soon are we going to go back to work here? Uh, you know, when, when's this going to be over on the COVID thing? You know, let's, you know, this has to move along, you know, move along, move along. Why is, why is Trump taking so long? What's the point? I, you know, if, uh, we have to get back to work. The cure can't be worse than the disease. Well, maybe you don't know what's going on. 
maybe there's things going on behind the scenes that you're not completely aware of in these underground tunnels, in these fights that aren't seen in the light of day. Maybe there's a war that you just plain haven't been paying attention to and dialed in on with these drug gangs. And we talk about the drugs. Oh, it's marijuana, it's cocaine, it's fentanyl, it's adrenochrome. Yeah. Where does that come from? And by the way, you don't think this was a plan? You don't think that this, you know, this just escaped from the lab? There's a very good school of thought um, from a number of locations with researchers. And they're saying, no, 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 no. This wasn't an accident from China. This was a plan. You know, you had generals back in 99 in China that wrote a book together mapping out how to conquer the West. You couldn't do it directly. You had to do it indirectly. And at the end, after you'd weakened them and you had everything positioned in just the right place, you cause a national viral emergency. And while they're down with that, you walk right in and take everything you want. And if you've got the cure for yourself, you and the infiltrators that had gone on ahead, your fifth column, take over everything, walk into the void. You don't have to fight for anything. You just come in and take it over. What's with all the tanks on our southern borders right now? We have men on ready five, ready to man those locations for the drug gangs coming in. What if uh, some of these drugs had been, uh, had um, viruses, other evil things sifted into them that could really hurt the population? It goes out into a weakened community of drug addicts and get spread around the country. And in a matter of a few days, you could have drug addicts all across the country carrying terrible diseases and um, probably a cocktail. And how's the country gonna deal with that? You think it was bad here? Well, we had a very measured shutdown that was relatively coordinated, intelligent, coherent. What if it truly had been a breakdown everywhere and you didn't even have time to get in position for it? Maybe you don't know everything that the president knows before you second guess him and the people around him on the wisdom of their judgment and the way that they've shut things down, closed off the border to China, no Chinese coming in. Who told them it's okay, go ahead and bring the Chinese, Chinese in? Who? Who? World Health Organization? Who? Who's, uh, whose interests are they protecting? The Chinese? By the way, all of the advertising, all of the Hollywood people, everybody that's, you know, helping to give us the right impression of what to do next. A big percentage of them. The talent agency that represents them. California Academy of Arts. 311. What day did Tom Hanks announce that he had COVID? Hey, by the way, get the get the uh, inoculation if you have to. That's what he was talking about back at the Golden Globes. If you get an inoculation, if they offer one, get it. Uh, 311. 311. And uh, uh, who owns 51% controlling interest of CAA? China. Even how you hear what's going on, and even in the movies, what did President Trump ask this woman reporter that asked uh, asked him a very loaded question the other day uh, concerning um, the Chinese uh, gifts of masks and everything to America, and was looking for an underhanded, you know, thank you, China, thank you, thank you, and he says, uh, and who do you work for? A uh, Hong Kong news agency. Who who do you work for? You work for China, right? Okay, so the, they're looking for a pat on the back when they're the ones where this disease came from. And was it an accident or was it very intentional? An act of war to take down the West and on the symbology. And who has been moving all of this control, this weapons of war, this technology, this manufacturing over to China? You know, the meme that's been going around. If you turn the... Uh, uh, Democrat Party over, will it have a made in China stamp on the bottom? Uh, but it's not just the Democrats. It's a lot of Republicans, too. Uh, there's plenty of people that have sold out on all sides. And then 
how pervasive is this invasion, uh, this infiltration, I should say, not invasion. You look at these people in all these federal positions and how they have really got a plan to work against the president consistently. Anything that the president has in mind, you keep coming back and it's like, oh my gosh. And that guy too, the intelligence community inspector general as a gatekeeper for all of the stuff that led to this whole impeachment fiasco. Um, we have a lot of people, look at the invasion there in you know these 25 people worshiping Horus Hor Hor there in the temple, uh, turning their ass to God. One of the things that people have to understand is that these people, you know, let's just think of it in, in terms of um, were they Israelites? Yes. Were they Jews? Yes. Um, were they uh, doing God's work? No. You can have people that go under a name, a title, that are still not doing what we as a nation would uh, agree to. And they get in places, uh, positions of authority. And that's what we have right now. What I would refer to maybe would be Luke eleven twenty three through 26. That's where Christ essentially said, uh, pick a lane. Pick a lane, a heavenly path or a hellish path. He said, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. The unclean spirit, when he is gone out of the man, passes through waterless places, seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will turn back into my house once I came out. And when he arrives back at his house, this person who he's been cast out of, he finds it swept and garnished. A person who's had a, a Passover, a, a, this, this demonic death spirit cast out of it. But think of our country. Right now, we just shut down. We stopped everything. And what did a lot of people do? House cleaning. We cleaned out our, our, cleaned out our garages, our houses, our cars. Uh, we sorted through stuff. Uh, we cleaned out the cupboards. We're doing a kind of a national house cleaning and preparing ourselves to restart again. And um, it's a beautiful thing. It's an important thing. And we can decide what things we're taking with us and what things we're going to leave behind, what things go in the trash bin and what things are, are keepers. And I would just say that within our churches, we need to think again. Are these festivals, celebrations that are practiced within our community actually scriptural, godly, either as Jews or Christians? Or are they some hybrid where the evil spirit has sifted in things? These lying dragon, snake serpents have sifted in things. You know, all a dragon is, is a snake with arms and legs. And who gives it arms and legs? Those that do Satan, Lucifer's will. We have those people all over the world giving legs and arms to Satan, sifting in these practices, putting their symbology right in plain sight. Our whole country has been run off the rails by a religious cult with that evil emblem at the center of our capital city. You can go across the country. You got Hollywood with the symbology of magic wands. You know, I mentioned CAA. What about National Academy of Theatrical Arts and Sciences? Okay, so what's that? I believe they're the ones that own the Golden Globes. Well, that's the Church of Satan. Mirrored, Yensid, mirrored. They hide in plain sight. And you don't realize it, but to any of their initiates, yeah, they're standing up and clapping with the golden idol handed the next one. Uh, uh, these idolic uh, symbols uh, at the Church of Satan.
They're all worshiping there. It's white magic. If you go along with the white magic, well, it's we only do good. By whose power? By Tammuz, by Isis, by Ishtar, by the idol of Playboy. Oh, yeah. And by the way, why does Playboy use a bunny? Who, where did even the money come from to start Playboy with Hefner? CIA. Lookout, yeah, with Lookout Mountain. Where was, where was um, Marilyn Monroe trained? She had ID for admittance into the Lookout Mountain CIA supervised studios, film studios at Lookout Mountain at the top of Topanga Canyon. She got all her training there, and then she went on and became this, the first big magazine she's in, uh, first edition, is uh, Playboy. And he's getting his money supposedly from friends and help and stuff like that. It's coming from CIA. They created a honeypot. When he got in trouble uh, on the finances, uh, the Playboy bunny jet, that gets it ended up being leased out to Department of Defense, and they're running the Nazis around on the Playboy jet of uh, all over the countryside and down into South America. Uh, uh, these Nazi paperclip scientists. I've talked about that before. So there's this tie between these things, and what are they doing? They're promoting these ideas right out there in plain sight with our money. What's Area Fifty One? Three times seventeen. The, the most powerful magic spell, the maximum magnification is three times. The Osiris number, right there at Area 51, our most you know, important military site. The Pentagon, five-sided, death to enemies and defense from the cult. The whole country is bathed in this uh, pagan god symbology, these Satanists, these Luciferians. And then what do they do? They are into blood sacrifices. That gate of ball that was brought over here, the significance was that they would bring their children through the gate to Moloch and offer their children to Moloch in order to get a good harvest. What is this time of year, the spring? And the history was to offer children in order to get a good harvest, to trade your child burning through the fire for a good harvest? What's happening right now in the country? The connotation is, is that we are freeing slaves from underground bunkers and locations, these children. And that's the work that we're doing right now, C before D. I don't care how long it takes for the president to get this accomplished, for the people around the president, for those teams that have trained for this. However long it takes, that's how long it takes. I don't care about an arrest. I don't care about anything until those persons that have been enslaved in this way are free and in good hands so we can begin to move on and heal as a country. And with this house swept clean, what does that demon do when it comes back later and the house is clean and garnished? with fresh air all through it, windswept. He goes out and he finds seven other demons more powerful and evil than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. We cannot, after this moment in time, go back to the old ways. You can't just get your house all clean and then go back to the same stuff you were doing before. You're going to go to a church where the pastor says, no, 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 we're just going to keep doing what we've always been doing. No, 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 no. It's okay to have hot cross buns. Well, go look at the scriptures. One of the things they were doing, the husbands, the wives, the children were making cakes to their, their gods. What we call Good Friday, uh, they were offering them there to their gods on that day. They were involved in all sorts of idolic practices worshiping pagan gods. Oh no, but on Good Friday, we have hot cross buns. Yeah, but the festival, the, the tradition itself is based in, in uh, the cult. And these people coming in and disguising themselves as good people in the church and leaders 
have sifted in these evil celebrations, just like they did in Jerusalem. Oh, no, no, he's a Jewish elder. He's in the temple every day. Well, if he's worshiping Horus, he's not a priest that I want working for me because he's not praying to the right God. He's got his ass to the right God. God needs to kick him in the ass when you get another priest in there and do it right. And if you're going to a church with a pastor that's still doing this worship this way, he needs to repent, mm-hmm. ask God for forgiveness for teaching his people wrong. He has blood on his hands. And I'm not understating that. Yep. Get right with God and go a different direction and turn again and stop this madness. And all of us, I believe that when the president comes out, as this crisis reaches a turning point and has a talk with the nation, a fireside chat, if if you will, he will lead us in asking us to thank God in heaven for sparing us all the evil that was pointed our way. Imagine if this crisis had happened after Hillary had been elected and all the people through the government hadn't been removed that have already been removed. And China had had a chance to send this plague on us the way that they did and then have their troops, their arms, their people able to just walk into the void as we're in some kind of a national calamity and can't even feel anything coherently because we're in disarray internally. And they come to help us and then become our occupiers. We dodged a bullet aimed at us. Better thank God for that. And then realize how did we get this close? Because we really weren't even looking to God. Only a handful somewhere along the way still understood it. And uh, we've somehow been protected from this moment. Now we need to, with a windswept house, a clean house, make a decision. You're coming up on a point of decision. Am I going to do things the old way? Am I going to continue the way that got me to this moment of crisis as a country and a world? Am I going to allow these people to operate in plain sight, these Satan worshipers, these Baal worshipers, these Moloch worshipers, these blood drinkers? Am I going to look the other way with their Hollywood dates and times and star festivals and everything else? Or am I going to reject all of that and turn to the God in heaven, ask forgiveness, repent, and go back to a resurrection day? Go back to a Passover day, thanking God that we've survived these evils and leave Egypt and go to the promised land and not adopt these ways again, these evil ways again that are out there. The devil wants us to, you know, blithely just let them back in a little at a time. They get control of these institutions, the next Hollywood magic and sift them in over time. And then next thing you know, we're taking candies and giving them to Moloch on top of uh, the Tower of Babel and hot cross buns. And we're right back where we were to begin with. This is a repeating theme over history, over time, making cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Well, the Queen of Heaven is Isis, Ishtar. And the children, Jeremiah 731, children sacrificed to Moloch. We have to pick a lane, and then we will have to live with the consequences of those choices. And there's a good path, a heavenly path, and a hellish path. I don't really, there's so much more I could say, but I, I think that that was my main point. And, and so much of it, then people have to make decisions themselves and have to make those choices and ask God. And if you think that, uh, you know, celebrating uh, the fertility egg bunny theme, uh, adrenochrome white rabbit, is a good thing and follow the white rabbit. Yeah, because we follow it doesn't mean that we worship it or that we want to be adorned with it. It's their symbology helps us to know who they are. The white rabbit, the playboy bunny of, of the adrenochrome cult, the sanctum cult, the NXIVM cult. Of, and by the way, just in case people have forgotten, those 
items retrieved from the Guatemalan Cultural Center a year ago. This crisis we're in right now, there was a plan a year ago for this attack to occur. This is plan B. Plan A was last year. And what happened at the Golden Globes presentation a year ago? Look at the imagery that they put out there. Everybody's supposed to, well, we were going to order pizza. What's the symbology of pizza? Uh But then we decided everybody's going out to their, you know, stuff afterwards. So let's not do the pizza. We'll just go again and give everybody a shot. And so we brought nurses in to give everybody a shot. Remember that, uh, Jennifer? Um, Yes, I remember you you talking about it. I don't think I watched it. it. Okay, well, the whole point was is that um, they were coding to everybody right there in plain sight that they were going to have some kind of a biological thing and they needed to take the shot, take the shot. Same thing as Tom Hanks, you know, take the shot. Something gets loose from the labs, take the shot on 311 gets coronavirus. What, what did they do in that Golden Globe ceremony? They put a napkin over the heads of anybody that didn't want to get the shot. And what was the significance of that? There's only one meal in the world that you put a napkin over your head when you're eating it. And it was almost, I think it was one of the very last, if not the last shows that Anthony Bourdain did before his suicide. And it was this eating of the Ortolan bird. You should go back, there was a great video done uh, on that. I'll try to find a link and send it to you. And the significance is that it has no nutritional value. When you boil the bird, in uh, the uh, sauce to marinate it, the the brandy to marinate it. The bird's last breath, you throw it in whole alive and it sucks in the brandy and marinates itself from the inside out with its final breath. And then you eat it whole, feathers, beak, bones, everything. It has no nutritional value really to speak of it. So tiny, so small, so innocent, just a beautiful songbird. And the people eating it, their mouths would get torn up by the bones and the feathers and all the stuff in there. So their mouth would literally be filled with blood while they were eating this. That's the Ortolan bird meal. It was actually outlawed as being um, of pure decadence. And yet that was the symbology that they were showing you last year at the Golden Globes. Why? Because they were about to do a sacrifice of innocence with this same type of a biological release. That was what those helicopters picked up with the nest teams there on Wilshire Boulevard over a year ago. They planned this for a year ago. They were delayed. This administration, the people advising the president, the military advisors in tight with him, helped us to avoid that silver bullet. But we're still not through the worst of it. We still have things ahead, threats ahead. We need to get the protection of God. We didn't fix this and save ourselves. No man, not the military advisors to the president or president himself, by themselves saved us. God himself saved us from this death angel over America. And We all, the president, his advisors, all of us citizens need to thank God for that and then look to God for how we're going to get through the rest of this crisis in this um, restart and this repair and restoration over the remainder of this year in the months ahead. And, uh, you know, look to God for that, that energy for the restart and thank God for the protection of that. Uh, Nobody needs to act as though they did it by themselves from the top to the bottom. This was an act of God. He gave us a window to choose a heavenly course or a hellish course. You decide. This is that moment in time. Um, This is the week to be praying about that, to be remembering that and decide if you're going to participate in the idolic pagan side of the religion with those people that are hiding in plays sight, these wizards, these witches, these evergreens, these phallic symbols, phalos, 
Osiris worshipers or the God in heaven? You worshiping Horus, the rising sun, Horus, or are you worshiping God at his throne for protecting us? You showing God your ass? Or are you going to turn around and show Isis your ass, Osiris your ass, and all these other assholes that have been after us? And get back on the right path and make it count. And advise the people around you, I'm not doing that again. I understand now what's at stake. I'm not being fooled again. I'm not going to be the devil's slave anymore. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>